Today is Thursday, April 18th. The big reveal on Capitol Hill today, what to expect from the Mueller report. Plus the brain research that will have you thinking about life, problems with an expensive smartphone, and the most influential people. Then hang out after the news for Thing to Know Thursday's bonus interview all about the college admissions scandal. Welcome, welcome to the Newsworthy. All the day's news in less than 10 minutes. Fast, fair, fun, and on the go. I'm Erica Mandy. Thanks so much for being here. You ready? Let's do this. Get ready. Today's the day we're expecting to see more of special counsel Robert Mueller's report. All eyes are on Attorney General William Barr. He'll be the one to release a redacted version of the full 400-page report. He's set to hold a news conference at 9.30 a.m. Eastern Time to talk about it. And the president said he might do the same and hold his own press conference. In fact, the New York Times reports the Justice Department and White House officials have already talked about what to expect from this. Remember, this is the report about the Russia investigation, the two years where special counsel Robert Mueller and his team investigated Russia's interference in the 2016 election and whether the Trump campaign colluded with Russia. So what can we expect from this redacted report today? The AP says it will likely detail President Trump's efforts to control that investigation. All we've seen so far is the attorney general's four-page summary of the report. It said Mueller's investigation found Trump did not conspire with Russia, but it also did not determine whether or not he obstructed justice. Keep in mind, some sensitive information in the full report will be blacked out. Expect to hear from Democrats about that. They want to see the whole thing. They're worried Barr is trying to protect Trump. If you want to see the report for yourself, you should be able to see it on the special counsel's website after it's made public. You can find a link to that in today's show notes. Stay tuned for more details. North Korea says it test-fired a new type of tactical guided weapon. The AP reports the test can't be verified yet, but if it's true, it's the first weapons test since leader Kim Jong-un met with President Trump. Remember, the two have been negotiating. The U.S. wants North Korea to get rid of its nuclear weapons, but the two leaders could not come up with a compromise when they met back in February. It doesn't appear this new test is one of the ballistic missiles that would really hurt the negotiations with the U.S., but it could still be a sign that Kim Jong-un is not happy that talks have stalled. So far, no response from President Trump, to be continued. Federal officials call it the, quote, largest prescription opioid enforcement effort ever undertaken. Prosecutors charge dozens of doctors, nurses, pharmacists, and other medical professionals in multiple states. The Wall Street Journal says they're accused of scheming to give out millions of the addictive pain pills. One would allegedly prescribe the drug to Facebook friends. Officials say these medical professionals are like drug dealers, and now they'll be treated that way. The latest data shows the opioid crisis caused more than 47,000 deaths in the U.S. in 2017. New research is being called a huge breakthrough. Scientists were able to restore some cellular function in pigs' brains who had been dead for hours. The study was published in the journal Nature. The Washington Post says scientists treated the brains for six hours with synthetic fluids designed to stop cell degeneration and restore their function. Think dialysis, but for the brain. And it worked. The brains continue to consume oxygen and glucose. Scientists stress they didn't bring the brains fully back to life, but the new system did restore some of the cell's functions. And that's still a big deal. National Geographic says it could lead to new therapies for stroke and brain disorders, but it will likely spark a debate about the line between life and death. Researchers say this is just the beginning. A NASA astronaut is expected to break a record. The Verge reports astronaut Christina Cook will spend nearly a year in space, which means she'll hold the record for NASA's longest continuous space flight by a woman. Cook has been at the International Space Station since last month. She was supposed to stay for six months, but her trip was extended, and now she's staying until next February. Cook will spend a total of 328 days in orbit. Much more news ahead, but first, a big thanks to Swap.com for sponsoring this week's episodes. My latest buy was a pair of Vince Camuto black heels that look like new, but were a fraction of the retail price. I used the filters online to put in my shoe size, the style and condition I wanted, and within a few minutes, I found those shoes. So if you want some quality, affordable, like new clothes or shoes without having to sift through racks and racks at a typical thrift store, then try out Swap.com. You can save up to 90% off retail prices from your favorite brands like Lululemon, Carter's, J. Crew, and Gap. They have stuff for women's, men's, juniors, kids, baby, and maternity, and there are always hassle-free returns within 30 days. 
It's also good for the environment and good for your closet if you'd like to send your never-worn clothes to Swap.com as well. So check it out. Go to Swap.com slash Newsworthy. And the Newsworthy listeners get a special offer. Sign up to get free shipping on your first purchase. Be sure to enter your email address to get that offer. Just go to Swap.com slash Newsworthy. That's Swap, S-W-A-P, Swap.com slash Newsworthy. Now back to the news. Today, Pinterest expects to begin trading on the New York Stock Exchange. MarketWatch reports the company priced its initial public offering, or IPO, higher than expected, valuing the company at more than $12 billion. Pinterest admits it's still in the early stages of actually making a profit, but its revenue is up and the number of users is still growing around the world. Already, there are some problems reported with Samsung's Galaxy Fold. It's the first device with a foldable screen. Tech reviewers from a few different media outlets, including The Verge and Bloomberg, say they've already had issues just two days in, some with flickering screens and another related to the hinge. Samsung is now telling people not to peel off the protective top layer. For some, that was the problem. For others, not so much. Samsung is reviewing any malfunctions reported and still plans to release the Galaxy Fold devices to the public next week as planned. Still, it's not a great start for a phone that costs nearly $2,000. Facebook is apparently working on a voice assistant. CNBC reports it's meant to be used in its portal video chat smart speakers, its virtual reality Oculus headsets, and future products. It could compete with Amazon's Alexa, Apple's Siri, and the Google Assistant. Facebook has already tried something like this before with a chat assistant called M that was used with Facebook Messenger. It didn't quite work out and it shut down. No word yet when Facebook's assistant could be ready. Adidas could be making a sneaker no one has seen before. Business Insider says the new shoe is called Future Craft Loop, which is designed to be the first 100% recyclable shoe. Adidas calls it a shoe made to be remade. Basically, customers buy the shoes, use them, wear them out, then give them back to Adidas. The shoes will be broken down into materials to make another new pair. Quartz reports the shoe is in beta testing right now, but if all goes well, the company plans to release them in 2021. By the way, Adidas already plans to release 11 million pairs of shoes made from recycled ocean plastic this year. Time Magazine released its picks for the top 100 most influential people. It's made up of entertainers, athletes, media personalities, and leaders. They include President Trump, Michelle Obama, Tiger Woods, LeBron James, and Taylor Swift, just to name a few. Six of those 100 will even get their own Time Magazine covers, including House Speaker Nancy Pelosi, Sandra Oh, and Gail King. And that's it for the main news today, but it's now time for Thing to Know Thursday, where a different expert explains a different thing to know only on Thursdays after the news. This week, we're talking about the college admissions scandal. We've talked about this on the show a few times, but here's a quick recap. It was called Operation Varsity Blues. Federal prosecutors say 50 people took part in a scheme that involved cheating on standardized tests and or bribing college coaches and officials to get kids from wealthy families into certain schools. Some celebrities were involved, including actresses Felicity Huffman and Lori Loughlin. So to help break it down, my guest today is Dan Golden. He's the senior editor at ProPublica, which is a nonprofit newsroom focused on investigative journalism. He's extensively covered college admissions. He even won a Pulitzer reporting on the topic for The Wall Street Journal and turned that series into a critically acclaimed 2006 best-selling book called The Price of Admission. So here's my conversation with Dan Golden. Hi, Dan. Thanks so much for coming on The Newsworthy. It's my pleasure. Thanks for having me. So we have a lot to talk about, but I want to start with this particular scandal that's in the news right now. When you first heard about this, what did you think, and how does this compare to what you already know from your reporting about wealthy families and college admissions? Well, in one sense, it fulfilled a lot of what I wrote about, so I wasn't that surprised. In another sense, it did take it to a whole nother level that uh, hadn't occurred to me. I mean, you know, most of what I wrote about in my book is what Rick Singer, the the college counselor who masterminded this particular scheme, uh, called the backdoor, which is people making big but illegal donations to get their kids into college. This went what he called the side door of illegal activity, uh, you know, rigging uh, the the tests to improve the test scores and and bribing colleges to make kids look like recruited athletes. So uh, I hadn't anticipated that, but 
my book did point out some of the loopholes with regard to recruited athletes and some of the other issues that have come up again and again. You recently wrote that you wanted that to be investigative journalism to kind of expose this, but that actually some wealthy parents who read it saw it as a how-to. Can you explain uh, what that was like for you? What were they asking you? And how far back does this sort of thing go? Well, uh, my book, you know, it, it exposed how this whole backdoor worked, how people bought their kids way into college. And it was something that hadn't really been written about. It was kind of a dirty little secret of American society. And so most people saw my book as an expose, but some rich people saw it as a how-to. Oh, here's how I can uh, get my kid into Harvard or Yale or Princeton or some other elite university. And sometimes they called me up and they'd ask me for advice or they'd even want to hire me as a consultant. The point of my book was to, you know, improve fairness and equity and not abet these practices. But it's interesting because I guess, you know, I could have become one of these independent college consultants who are so omnipresent now and are charging huge fees to uh, uh, get kids into college. As to how far back it goes, um, you know, I think it's gone back for, for a long time. People, these backdoor of people making big gifts to get their kids into college. I think the amounts have probably gone up with inflation and as admissions has gotten even harder. You know, the fact that these schools have gotten ever more selective, uh, even since I wrote my book, has, of course, fueled the desperation of parents and their willingness to uh, uh, make large gifts or in some cases bribes to uh, get their kids in. So when we hear that some of these celebrities, at least, could face up to 20 years in prison, what do you think that they should receive? I know you're not a lawyer, but how serious is this? You know, I see a hefty amount of white collar crimes and people always sort of ask when there's white collar crime, oh, you know, this isn't uh, a violent crime. You know, maybe it shouldn't require prison time. But, you know, it's very damaging to the country and the culture and to national confidence in, in college admissions. So, you know, in its own way, this is a pretty significant crime. And, and I think uh, at least some uh, prison time for the worst offenders would not be out of place. There's currently a class action lawsuit against eight of the colleges involved that, at least in part, claims that the scandal devalues all students' degrees from those schools. Do you think that's true? And what might come of this lawsuit? In a strange way, I don't think this does devalue the uh, the students' degrees because the incredible obsession with these parents of spending you know, any amount of money, hundreds of thousands of dollars or millions of dollars, to get their kids into the, these elite schools you know, in a strange way, it testifies to the power of that brand. Now, so I'm not, I'm not sure the degrees are worth less. It's, this seems to me to be evidence of how much those degrees are worth. Where do we go from here after this very public scandal that has now caused a lot of public outrage? I don't think there will be huge fundamental change. Uh, there will be, and there already is starting to be, some small changes designed to fix the particular uh, loopholes that were exploited here. So, for example, if a coach puts your child forward as a recruited athlete, the admissions committee seems to accept that candidate automatically without checking if they actually play the sport competitively. So schools are already saying that they're, they're going to you know, check into the athlete's credentials more closely, particularly if the athlete enters the school, the purported athlete, and then doesn't actually join the team. So uh, that would be an example of kind of a small superficial fix. The deeper changes... Uh, have not really uh, been addressed, uh, and I don't think they will be addressed because so many people benefit from the current system, uh, and it crosses party lines. You know, rich Democrats and rich Republicans make big gifts to uh, to get their children in, and they have no incentive to uh, to end that practice. Do you think college is less important today as we hear stories about people like Steve Jobs who dropped out of college and went on to create Apple? Very often, our great entrepreneurs and great geniuses uh, don't go to college or drop out of college. I mean, Bill Gates also uh, left Harvard. He, did, he didn't complete his education there. Uh, there have been many famous dropouts who are incredible successes. I mean, Henry David Thoreau, I believe, dropped out of Harvard, the, the author of Walden. Now, what generally happens is that those people are so smart and so visionary and so talented, they don't need four years of college. It bores them. They, they would rather go out and you know start their new company or, or fulfill their vision. But then they want to send their kids and their grandchildren to 
to, to, to the elite colleges. You know, th- those kinds of brains and vision are not always inherited. And in order to cement their family's place in the American aristocracy, they want to get their, their kids all set and uh, make the family's fortunes permanent. So it's a long been a standard pattern that the founder of the family dynasty doesn't go to these colleges, but they try like hell to get their, uh, uh, the next generations in. And you can learn much more about today's guest and his book in today's show notes, along with links to all the stories we mentioned in this episode. Just go to thenewsworthy.com, click episodes, and find today's date. Thank you so much for listening. Thank you for sharing this episode if you found it interesting. And as always, The Newsworthy is here for you by four in the morning every weekday. We'll chat again tomorrow. Have a great day. Have a great day.